So, in this session, we are going to discuss about refrigeration techniques and the respective refrigeration cycles. You see, refrigeration as we have discussed in this session of second law, I have mentioned that there we have to continually withdraw heat from a cold box which is a space having a low temperature, an enclosed space having a low temperature. So, <coughs> this withdrawal of heat from a low temperature, we can facilitate that process if I allow the liquid at low pressure to evaporate with a thermal interfacing with cold box. So, definitely this is the technique the standard universal technique to withdraw heat from a cold box, but at the same time it is again to be returned to the liquid state. Now, how we can do this? In the first case we can actually compress that vapor from this outlet of refrigerator and condense it at high pressure. So, we will get a liquid at high pressure and again recirculate it back at the inlet of this evaporator at low pressure upon using either a throttle valve or an expander right. So, this is the policy we apply for vapor compression refrigeration cycle. On the other hand, uh, if we avoid want to avoid this cost of compression, what we can do? The vapor generated at the outlet of this evaporator we will allow it to absorb in uh, this another solvent right. So, we will get a solution it is a typical liquid absorption we will get a solution and that solution uh, the pressure of that solution will be increased upon pumping and uh, there at uh, higher pressure and higher temperature what will happen? We will have a thermal interface with steam where the vapor or the liquid will be or the vapor will be regenerated right and the solvent will circulate back and will again feed that to this uh, evaporator inlet. So, that is called the policy of absorption refrigeration. So, these are the two techniques absorption then regeneration and again you throttle it back to this inlet of the evaporation system. So, primarily we will discuss about the vapor compression cycle. So, in nutshell refrigeration we have two different types one is vapor compression refrigeration another is absorption refrigeration so first we will discuss this vapor compression refrigeration cycle so as i mentioned everywhere uh, we have the evaporator which is a universal structure for vapor compression as well as a, this absorption refrigerator. So, evaporator then we have a compressor ok. then followed by a condenser where we reject it and then we can either use an expander where we can generate some amount of work in the compressor we require some amount of work. or alternative to that 
we may use a throttle valve. Right. So, this is one or here it is one prime, this is two, three and four, this is throttle valve. So, you take up heat at a rate of q dot c and reject heat at a rate of q dot h, right. So, that is the overall structure of this vapor compression cycle and we have to understand the process in T s diagram. And let us say this is the saturation curve. of the refrigerant now first we evaporate now evaporation you see it starts from either here or it may be this process okay let me draw it separately So, truly it will be the direction of this is truly it will be in the direction of increasing entropy and here also it will be in the direction of increasing entropy right. So, this is point 1. 2, 3 and 4, vapor compression cycle with expander. So, you see here that we know that coefficient of performance is q c dot divided by q h dot minus q c dot. So, q c dot is m dot from here to here it is uh, h 2 minus h 1 q h dot it is the same mass flow rate of the refrigerant H 3 minus H 4 minus m dot H 2 minus H 1 right. So, it is going to give us H 2 minus H 1 divided by H 3 minus H 4 minus H 2 plus H 1. Right, or let us write it like this. So, you see when it is fitted with an expander, we have minus of w dot e is equal to m dot into h 1 minus h 4. Right. So, minus w e equal to h 1 minus h 4. So, what we can write here h 2 minus h 1 divided by h 3 minus h 2 plus h 1 minus h 4. So, the coefficient of performance becomes 
h2 minus h1 divided by h3 minus h2 minus we. So, that is the expression for vapor compression cycle fitted with a turbine or sorry expander. What we are doing actually? Here at this inlet of this, this dotted line represents the isentropic expansion or uh, this isentropic expansion through this expander. So, anyway it will be either 1 or something 1 a. So, from there it is con being converted at the outlet of the evaporator to saturated vapor. Now, we are compressing it the dotted line shows perfect vertical line which is reversible adiabatic that is isentropic compression or this solid line represents the actual process from there it is being condensed. So, this, this part the superheat is first removed and next it is converted to saturated liquid at high pressure. So, from there we again uh, either throttle it or expand it and here we are using an expander. So, this is the expression of coefficient of performance. Now, on the other hand if I use this uh, throttling. So, for throttling you see again the same saturation curve and throttling is inherently reversible. So, we can cannot have any vertical uh, analog of this 4 to 1 here. So, what will happen? This will start from this. We consider isentropic expansion, condensation and this will be the throttling process right. So, this is 1 prime then here it is 2 then 3 then 4. So, coefficient of performance becomes h 2 minus h 1 divided by h 3 minus h 4 minus h 2 plus h 1. Now, you see when we are discussing with the vapor compression cycle with throttle valve, for throttle valve what we have h 4 equal to h 1 throttling precisely it is isenthalpic or at least we know that inlet and outlet enthalpy is the same or rather here it is h 1 prime. So, h 1 prime is equal to h 4. So, it cancels out giving h 1 minus h 2 divided by h 3 minus h 2 right. So, previous expression you see that C O P there is an additional negative term in the denominator. So, when we are fitting a uh, expander we are getting higher C O P right. So, C O P expander is greater than C O P throttle. So, that is all about the vapor compression cycle of refrigeration. Next we will discuss this absorption refrigeration. So, in the absorption refrigeration you see let us let us not go by expander let us say it is a throttle valve purely 4 and this is 1. This part where we are attaching the compressor that is different right that is only different. So, what will be the process? From the evaporator outlet we have the saturated vapor that first we will absorb with another solvent. So, this is the absorber 
So now we have a solution. Once it is absorbed, we have a solution. So left hand side is uh, this part is identical to vapor compression cycle. fitted with throttle valve. So instead of compressor, now we are absorbing it at low pressure. Next, we pump it and feed it to the regenerator. where we have say supply of medium pressure steam right once we are feeding it to the regenerator the regenerator actually yield the refrigerant at high pressure because already we have pumped it right so that refrigerant will be fed to the condenser and we have to recirculate back the solvent. Now the solvent here is at high pressure, here the absorption is taking place at low pressure. So we have to throttle it back. So here we need an additional throttle valve. Now this is at low temperature, whereas here this regenerated liquid is at high temperature. So this stream what we are pumping it is favored if it is heated and this is to be cooled. So we simply fix a heat exchanger here. Right. So what is the process C? The same compression we are reducing the power upon converting it to the liquid state and as we convert it to the liquid state what will happen? The amount of volume of the material to be handled abruptly reduces. Previously it was vapor, right? In vapor compression cycle it was vapor and we have to fed it to the compressor directly. Now here what we are doing? We are absorbing it in a solvent. Next we have got a solution. The solution's pressure we are increasing feeding it to the heat exchanger and finally to the regenerator where we actually use heat right of the medium pressure steam to regenerate the <coughs> refrigerant at high pressure. Regenerate the refrigerant at high pressure and high temperature and next it will be compressed, uh, sorry condensed. So the technique is very similar. to the idea behind uh, absorption refrigeration. So you see actually we are operating a refrigerator, it is a schematic. So we have R, this is Q dot C then Q dot H and this is say T H. Now we operate a heat engine between these two. And the work generated by the heat engine is delivered here. So that is the basic idea. Here this TH is the ambient temperature where the heat is being released and medium pressure steam has got a temperature TS. So actually the, there is a hypothetical heat engine operating between TS and TH which generates work and that is being used up by the refrigerator. So you see the same thing actually we do in vapor compression cycle but that part we do not see. Why? Why I am saying? 
if I ask you that you are compressing the vapor, fine. Where from you are getting that energy or the work? Definitely from electricity. How the electricity is being generated in a thermal power station? And what is being done in a thermal power station? There are heat engine is operating. So basically, the same idea, you simply converge into a small unit and you get what is called absorption refrigerator, right? So the technically, here we have to use a third component that is solvent and additionally we have to use an utility that is the medium pressure steam. Now what are the common refrigerant and absorbent used in absorption cycle? Water as refrigerant and lithium bromide as absorbent. Alternatively here, the problem is we cannot go beyond uh, below this 0 degree Celsius. So we use ammonia as refrigerant and water as absorbent. So here we can go for sub-zero temperature. Additionally, one is very important that how we select refrigerant for vapor compression cycle. You see that evaporator box or evaporator which is having a thermal interface with a cold box that operates at low pressure, right? So there will be some piping arrangement and coils and all which is having interface with this cold box and where from this evaporation takes place inside. So as it operates at low pressure through this welding joint there is always possibility that if the pressure is extremely low that vapor will gush in, right? Like what I am trying to say if this is evaporator and here we have the thermal interface with the cold box. This is two phase. Here it is saturated vapor, right? And that is the evaporator. And the cold box is generally you see, you see in the refrigerator that cold box has got that atmospheric pressure. And inside the refrigerator we have here. So there is every possibility that air may leak in, air leakage in, right, because it operates at a very low temperature and pressure. On the other hand, in condenser, this is superheated vapor and this is saturated liquid, right? And this operates at high pressure. This operates at low pressure. So here, the refrigerant may leak out. Right. So here the refrigerant is leaking out. So in order to prevent this, what we have to do? We should have, in order to prevent this air leakage in a evaporator, we should have moderately high pressure of refrigerant even at low temperature. And at the same time, when its temperature of the refrigerant is being increased, its pressure should not be much higher above much above and over than that of atmospheric pressure. That means the common condition that PSAT should not be sensitive to temperature, right? The saturation pressure should not change much 
with changing temperature from a sub zero to say uh, 60 70 degrees celsius because the ambient temperature in a country like us in you know, uh, this where where the temperature is average temperature is around 25 to 20 25 degree so the in some of the temperature goes up to 40 degree right so the condenser will operate at a temperature of 60 70 degree we should have a uh, approach of 20 to 30 degree whereas in the cold box interface the cold box operates at temperature say minus 5 degree or minus 10 degree right or even in freezer it goes to minus 18 degree so from minus 18 degree the cold box is operating at minus 18 degree so this and it's taking up the refrigerator this evaporator is taking up heat from the cold box so it should be still uh, another 20 20 degree lower its temperature should be another 20 degree lower than that of the cold box temperature so you can imagine that there will be at least around say minus 30 degree let's say and here it operates at plus 60 degree so overall a 90 degree temperature jump as we move from evaporator to the condenser so over this temperature range if the vapor pressure is not changing pretty much right so for those materials are suitable as refrigerant okay and at the same time it should not have a very low pressure very low saturation of this pressure at this evaporator so you see we know this vapor pressure is related to temperature by Anton's equation so if we take the derivative with temperature we get it is b divided by t plus c whole square so high is, is the b it will be more sensitive sensitive to this temperature so for a good refrigerant we should have a low value of second and trans coefficient b right as far as possible so good refrigerant must have low value of b and the synthetic material which corroborates with this property of low second and trans coefficients are cfc right chlorofluorocarbon however this chlorofluorocarbon they are very potent uh, molecule which degrade this ozone layer and they have got a very high half life they don't generally degrade once released in atmosphere so that's why cfc's use of cfc's are nowadays banned so we use we replace this with hcfc hydrochlorofluorocarbon and nowadays we are more prone or we are nowadays the, this refrigerator they are using hydrocarbons also right like methane ethane etc this mixture of that that also is being used as a good refrigerant uh, for this modern refrigerator because it saves a lot of cost of synthesis and procurement of this hcfc because hcfc is a synthetic molecule and it's costly <clears throat> so that's all about the refrigeration system so next we'll discuss the liquefaction techniques liquefaction you see it's very very important operation in chemical process industry liquefaction of gases right it's not liquefaction of vapor it's liquefaction of gases we are discussing about because this is for uh, cryogenic distillation of air to get this oxygen and nitrogen nitrogens are all required in process industry to create this inert environment so large plants like refineries and all they have their in-house uh, cryogenic refrigeration units where they generate this nitrogen for inertization of atmosphere required or environment required inside different process equipment and also we get this oxygen which may be fed to that furnace or boilers or may be used as process oxygen where it is required so liquefaction
there are two techniques but before going into that let's discuss about the possible ways how we can liquefy a gas you see that in ts plot again there will be the saturation curve if we are close to this point say here we are here right so we can achieve liquefaction if we follow isobaric cooling let's say this is pathway 1 or if we expand it b however if we throttle it we are not getting to the liquid state right so just like here also we can have the same like here if i cool it i so i this uh, in a isobaric form we will get the liquid if we expand it through a turbine or expander we'll get liquid however if we throttle we are not getting it so the fact is amongst these pathways a b c which one is most favored basically it is c right throttling it's the simplest equipment and we we are throttling it and we are getting liquid however see from this position or this position through throttling we are not getting the liquid why this step is not favored this isobaric cooling because for isobaric cooling of a gas right you need another low temperature source which can only be generated through liquefaction so this isobaric cooling as a process of liquefaction is negated we do not actually rely on that because of utility problem now expander definitely you can do it but there will be severe erosion problem as we have discussed in case of implementation of Carnot cycle even whenever we have a wet exhaust a liquid vapor mixture at the outlet of this turbine there will be severe erosion problem and here this will happen in inevitably this is going to happen because if we expand more or less isentropically then at this outlet we have a huge amount of liquid right so it's a kind of wet gas so if i separate out definitely we are getting liquid but the lifespan of this turbine will reduce drastically but throttling we are not getting anything however if i switch this point to somewhere here right somewhere here then by throttling we can generate liquid so the idea is that don't go by this you have the gas somewhere here right so you compress it first so you first compress it step 1 you go to step 2 then go for isobaric cooling step 3 next you throttle it 4 so this is compression this is isobaric cooling however this cooling we will accomplish differently we will discuss it but we are not going directly into the liquid state still it is uh, it is in the vapor state and from the point 3 we throttle it right and this process gave rise to Linde process of liquefaction right so how to implement it through attaching devices in sequence first we have a compressor and here we deliver the gas around state 1 now from the compressor there will be a pre-cooler water cooled heat exchanger which we call pre-cooler next further the temperature is to be reduced so we use a heat exchanger and next we throttle it and that is the liquefied gas holder
the definitely whenever we are throttling everything is not going to liquefy it will be a two phase mixture but the gas phase we have to recirculate back but even but but it has got a very low temperature so that low temperature state we will use as the cooling stream in this heat exchanger and we will recirculate it back right so this is the steady state operation during the startup we don't have the stream so we ha should have a storage of this uh, low temperature utility which may be another liquefied gas which we circulate here generate the stream attach or this achieve the steady state and next open this line and we will continue the process so here see if i have the points named as 1 then 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 so we may write the mass balance and the sap at each and every or over each and every device like m1 dot plus m9 dot equal to m2 dot now m1 dot this is simply mixing process h1 plus m dot 9 h9 is equal to m dot 2 h2 right now m dot 2 into h3 minus h2 is equal to minus w dot c the work required is a compressor so we are simply using the sfe next here in the pre cooler if q dot amount of heat is being released right pre cooler so q dot pre cooler or pc pre cooler is equal to the same m dot 2 the same m dot 2 and m dot 3 are same so m dot 2 or we can write here m dot 2 is equal to m dot 3 so here we write this m dot 3 into this uh, h4 minus h3 right now m dot 3 is equal to m dot 4 here so m dot 4 and this is being cooled so obviously we write h4 minus h5 is equal to m dot 9 this m dot 9 and m dot 8 are same m dot 9 and that is being heated into h9 minus h8 so after the pre cooler we have m dot 4 again is equal to m dot 5 right and m dot 5 is equal to m dot 6 and h5 is equal to h6 because it is throttling and inlet and outlet enthalpies are same now at this point 6 we have m dot 6 is equal to m dot 7 plus m dot 8 right and m dot 8 is equal to m dot 9 and there the enthalpy balance will result that h6 into m dot 6 h7 into m dot 7 plus this m dot 8 into h8 now whatever is being fed to this gas liquid separator apart we are getting as liquid so let this x be the amount liquefied that is m dot 7 divided by m dot 6 so h6 we can write as h7 into x plus 1 minus x into this h8 so these are the collective SFE set for this Linde process of liquefaction. So you see that if I want to improve the efficiency what we can do? We can simply attach replace this throttle by an expander and that becomes a clawed process technically. However, here for this expander there will be severe erosion problem. 
So, we bit modify this process right such that in the downstream of the turbine or expander will not have any liquid, but how come we do not have any liquid our basic objective is to liquefy. So, what is the modification of this Linde to the Claude process? So, Claude process of liquefaction you see again the same compressor the gas then we have the pre cooler then we split the heat exchanger into two why I will discuss. From here as usual we have the throttle valve is liquefied gas now here we bled off a stream and fed it to the expander we generate the work such that in the downstream the condition is very similar to the gas stream which is returning back from the gas liquid separator. So, we simply mix them up then through the heat exchanger. and returning back to this cycle of compression. So, this is 1, this is 2, 3, 4, then 5, here 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 right these are the points. So, what will be the mass and energy balance according to SFE? So, m dot 1 plus m dot 2 same as Linde that is equal to sorry m dot uh, this 15 not 2 it is 15 this stream is equal to m dot 2. So, h 1 into m dot 1 plus H 15 into m dot 15 m dot 2 into H 2. Next here we have the compressor. So, m dot 2 into H 3 minus H 2 is minus of W dot C. So, next it is the pre cooler. Now, m dot 2 is equal to m dot 3 and m dot 3 into this h 4 minus h 3 we have q dot pre cooler right. Next m dot 3 is equal to m dot 4 and m dot 4 into this is being this stream is getting cooled. So, H 4 minus H 5 is equal to this m dot 15 this stream m dot 15 and that is being heated. So, H 15 minus H 14 right. So, 
m dot 4 is equal to m dot 5 here and m dot 5 is equal to m dot 6 plus m dot 11 right 6 and 11 but the conditions remain same okay like we can write h5 is equal to h6 is equal to h11 that's an additional equation now again when it enters here this m dot 6 that's further getting cooled into h6 minus h7 h6 minus h7 is equal to m dot uh, this 13 and m dot 13 and m dot uh, 14 15 are same so this is 14 this is 15 this is 13 so, so let's write m dot 15 right so m dot 15 into that's getting heated so h14 minus h13 right now further m dot 6 is equal to m dot 7 m dot 6 and m dot 7 are same right and m dot 7 is equal to m dot 8 and also we have same enthalpy here so h7 is equal to h8 right h7 is equal to h8 next we can write the equation for the turbine that is m dot 11 we have used m dot 11 yes m dot 11 has been used so m dot 11 into h12 minus h11 12 minus 11 is equal to minus of w dot e right next here there will be a mixing up and here we have to write the balance equation so m dot 8 h8 up to that we have written so next it is m dot 8 into h8 is equal to m dot 9 into h9 plus m dot 10 into h10 and obviously m dot 8 is equal to m dot 9 plus m dot 10 right and additionally m dot 12 m dot 12 m dot 12 and m dot 11 we have used so m dot 12 is equal to m dot 11 and m dot 12 plus m dot 10 is equal to m dot 13 which is 14 and it is equal to 15 so m dot 15 and finally there is an enthalpy balance to be written so m dot 12 h12 plus m dot 10 h10 is equal to m dot 15 however it will be h30 so that is the entire set of possible mass balance and SFE for Claude refrigeration cycle right so Linde and Claude both are compatible units however in Claude we are generating some amount of work so technically though there is nothing called efficiency of a liquefaction or coefficient of performance of a liquefaction process but as the net work required in this Claude cycle is lower because we are compensating some of the work of compressor by this work output of this expander so definitely we can infer that the cloth cycle is more efficient at least qualitatively compared to that of Linde cycle so that's all about liquefaction so next that's basically all about this thermodynamics of the flow process and different units and combinations of units giving rise to a definite process of great technical utility right so lastly what i would like to discuss just we have seen that there is a huge importance of this ts plot right there is a huge importance of this ts plot everything we are mapping in terms of ts plot and we have understood that what will be the TS plot for Carnot cycle, for Rankine cycle, for Rankine cycle with feed water heater, 
for refrigerator for vapor compression refrigerator we have discussed. However, we have not discussed it that what will be the TS of auto and diesel cycle right. So, let us discuss it. So, TS diagram of auto and diesel cycle right. So, in PV space how an auto cycle looks? Two isochoric steps connected by two adiabatic steps right. Two isochoric steps connected by two adiabatic steps 1, 2, 3 and 4. So, in T s 1 to 2 you see it is reversible adiabatic step. So, entropy remains constant this. Next it is an isochoric step like this. So, in we have established I think that ok let me establish it once again that here uh, isochoric step reversible. So, what we have exactly d q is equal to d u plus p d v right. So, isochoric step means this part is 0 and d q reversible. So, it is T d s is equal to d u and for ideal gas here to here we are assuming ideal gas it is C v d t right. So, del T del s at constant volume del t del s at constant volume is cv by t ok. That is the del t del s uh, So, this is no uh, del t del s is t by cv sorry t divided by C v del t del s is t divided by C v. So, second derivative if we check is 1 by C v into del t del s. So, that is t divided by C v square that is positive. So, it will be with increasing slope ok. So, it is exactly consistent it will be with positive and increasing slope. So, again so this is step 1, this is 2, this is 3. So, here we will have 4 why because 3 to 4 is reversible adiabatic. So, isentropic, so constant entropy and finally, this has been joined to another isochoric step right. So, that is the auto cycles T s plot. So, if I have diesel cycle it is like this. One, two, three, and 4. Now, for diesel cycle if I want to calculate or want to construct this T s plot. So, first it is isentropic step 1 to 2. So, it is just like this. Next it is an isobaric step. You see isobaric steps means d h equal to d q equal to d h minus v d p. So, that is 0. So, for reversibility this is T s and this d h is equal to C p d t ok. So, del t del, del t del s del t del s at constant p is t divided by C p ok and del square t del s square is this t divided by C p square. Now, the point is C p is greater than C v for ideal gas. So, del t del s at constant p it is going to the denominator is less than del t del s at constant v. So, this slope will be lower compared to that of 
the slope here. So it will be something like this. Okay. Next again, this step, and here we are going back by reversible isochoric. So here the step will be, or the slope will be higher. So in auto cycle, these two lines are nearly. In auto cycle, these two lines are nearly parallel. See, they nearly parallel to each other. Whereas in diesel cycle, this line, because it is an isochoric step, will have a higher slope than that of isobaric step. So, So that is the T s plot. So, specifically, we have to in construction of T s plot, say a process is given and you are asked that okay, you draw this respective T s diagram. So, what you have to note that in T s plot, see what is the strategy of drawing. This must be isothermal all reversible. This is adiabatic, this is isobaric where the slope is T by C P and this will be isochoric. where the slope is T by C V which is higher because C P is for an ideal gas the C P is higher than C V as we know C P minus C V equal to R. So that is all about this S F E in the next session we are going to discuss about or we will start discussing about the solution thermodynamics starting from the fundamental property relation and then going to the chemical potential and all. Thank you.